Okay, our next speaker uh, for this session is Professor Jerome Gallon. Uh, that is not new for this audience as well. Um, he is the research director, the chief French National Institute of Health and uh, Medical Research, the INSERM Laboratory of uh, Integrative Cancer Immunology in Paris. And he will talk about redefining cancer with uh, inter, uh, integrative uh, tumor immunology, novel cutting edge immunotherapies for patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Thanks for the invitation to the organizers. Um, so here are my disclosures. I do talk to people in industry. Um, so I'd like to go back to um, the definition of cancer, how it is uh, seen, uh, and how it is uh, a stage. How do we consider cancer? So of course cancer is initially based on the progression of a given tumor in a given organ due to alteration of the genome. We know it's a genetic disease. There are mutations, driver mutations, plus there are additional uh, genomic alterations such as chromosomal instability, microsatellite instability, etc. And then there is invasion, lymph node invasion, which is the end stage, early metastatic invasion, venous emboli, M stage, and later on uh, tumor recurrence. And these tumor aggressiveness parameters, the progression of, the, of a cancer, the T stage, the tumor stage, T from T1 to T4, the recurrence, uh, define what we consider uh, an early stage cancer, a late stage cancer, and really defines the severity of the disease and defines also the way we are treating patients. And back in the early 2000, let's say, uh, the all marks of cancers were the, the, the following on the top, all concentrating on the tumor cells themselves. And along the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years, uh, we'd like to propose a novel paradigm for cancer where, in fact, all those key criteria of tumor progression, tumor invasion, the recurrence of a cancer, are all dependent on a pre-existing immunity that all patients have. And depending on the strength of this pre-existing immunity, um, with a evaluation of the immune contexture of a cancer, the immune microenvironment, and I will talk about an assay to measure that in a systematic way, the immunoscore assay, these parameters, this pre-existing immunity, in fact, are also associated with the survival of the patient, define the fate and the survival of the patients, define the fate of the tumor cells themselves. And now that we have uh, uh, immunotherapies that are efficient, what we have been seeing is that the pre-existing immunity of the patients is also determining the likelihood of response to these immunotherapies that are targeting not the tumor cells, but they're targeting the immune cells. So um, uh, Aral talked about the early development of cancer, and of course there are vaccines to pretend that, but in terms of treating uh, existing cancer, really uh, the cancer immunotherapy field before 2010 was really almost nothing. Um, and in 2011, there was the first approval of uh, what's so-called an immune checkpoint that is targeting, it is epilimumab, which is an antibody targeting T cells to basically inhibit uh, uh, an inhibitory molecule at the surface of the T cells, therefore restoring uh, the T cell functions. And in two years, there was a, a boom of uh, many, many uh, uh, cancer types that have been shown to be very uh, uh, efficient in uh, uh, response to these type of immune checkpoint blockades, uh, so that, uh, uh, in fact, now we have a lot of immunotherapies available in multiple cancer. So what are the founding principles of these immune checkpoint blockade inhibition? First, in the early 2000s, there was the demonstration in deficient mouse model that immunosurveillance of cancer was really existing. And uh, I will talk about a lot about this part because this is where we've been uh, a lot involved, uh, where we showed and demonstrated the major importance of this pre-existing immunity, and in particular adaptive immune cells, and in particular intratumoral T cells at the time where cancer are present, 
And in fact, those immunotherapies, the checkpoints in particular, are unleashing this pre-existing immunity through the inhibition of these receptors that are at the surface of the T cells. Um, so there's a big difference now in the way pa patients are treated because the previous ways were basically trying to kill tumor cells, whether it was through radiotherapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapy. The main goal was really to target the, tum the tumor cell, trying to kill them. The new way with immunotherapy is not to target the, T cell, the, the tumor cells, but to target the host and to modulate the immune response of the patients. And uh, people now are talking about cure of patients because this is becoming the fourth pillar of uh, cancer treatment. So we've, of course, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. We have a big difference in uh, the response of the patient. So it was uh, in 2013, uh, the cover and the breakthrough of the year, uh, cancer immunotherapy where, in fact, some patients really have now a cancer cure with long-term survival uh, in a specific group of patients that are responding to these types of treatment. So in comparison to the previous types of treatment, whether they were chemotherapy, targeted therapies, in most of the case, there was the benefit and the approval of the drugs were based on a median, an increase in the median of the population survival, which was quite modest. But in fact, all the patients are reaching uh, the control at some point and basically are all relapsing or all dying. Um, and only this delta was taken into account to approve drugs. The big difference, and this is an example of a targeted therapy, very efficient, uh, where p this patient was treated as a BRAF mutation, so was treated with a RAF inhibitor, very efficient drugs. But as it is known, these types of treatment allow tumor escape. And very soon after, few weeks after, tumor is recurring and uh, patients are dying, which is basically an example case of what is happening on those survival curves. The big difference with immunotherapy is that in comparison to these control or uh, 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 types of previous treatment curves, what is happening with immunotherapy is now that we have a tail on the curve. And there is a long-term survival for a subgroup of patients that are responding to the therapy. So this is really a revolution in cancer medicine because the shape of the survival curves are really different, so it means this is the percentage of survival and this is the time after treatment. Uh, so now there's a group of patients that seem to be cured, at least for years, almost decades now. And the second point is that it is inefficient for some of the patients. Well, so there's a subgroup of patients that are not responding, and of course we need to understand why is that. So uh, there's, as I said, since the first initial, so the, before that, there was almost no immunotherapy uh, approved. In 2011, the first in melanoma patients, ipilimumab was approved. The breakthrough of the year was uh, in 2013 because the patients with lung cancer were responding. And this was a major point. And now multiple cancers have been uh, uh, targeted uh, 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 and tr patients have been treated with immunotherapies, with checkpoint blockades. Uh, and uh, uh, these drugs have been approved in multiple cancer types. Uh, also with biomarkers, which means to try to define these groups of patients that are responding to these immunotherapies. And this is now the objective response rate of patients uh, uh, that have been treated with anti-PD-1, which is another checkpoint, which is the most efficient uh, uh, checkpoint to date. So either anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL-1. So anti-PD-1 at the surface of T cells. So these are all cancer types where very strong response have been seen. And in red, you see already the FDA approval. So these drugs are now being approved month after month in many different indications. So when we started working on uh, human cancers, which was really in 2000, uh, uh, immunotherapy was not existing. Uh, and um, the immune microenvironment was not considered, as I said, as a major important parameter. 
And so we wanted to try to understand these very, very complex tissue in which uh, uh, there are multiple cells, not focusing on a particular molecule, not fo focusing on a particular pathway. I had no favorite cells, but trying really to do systems biology in human uh, conditions, in human cancer, trying to decipher the immune microenvironment of cancer, trying to see uh, uh, what was important or not important. And this is an example of a colon cancer. So you've seen colon cancer uh, 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 in the previous uh, presentation. So this is the normal epithelium. Here is the carcinoma. And at distance, you can see massive tertiary lymphoid structure. And inside the cancer, inside the carcinoma, you can find basically every single cell of the immune system. You can, s you can find all subsets of CD40 helper cells, Th1 subset, Th2 subset, Th Treg subsets. You can find memory T cells. You can find all the subsets of memory T cells, all the subsets of cytotoxic T cells, many types of B cells, all types of innate cells, macrophages, neutrophils, eosinophils, all types of NK cells, of subtypes of dendritic cells, at different locations in different areas uh, with different uh, uh, phenotype, with different level of activation, depending on the patient, depending on the tumor. But basically, all those cells are present in any tumor. And so really what was, uh, uh, we wanted to address was, is it really important to have this type of pre-existing immunity? Does it really matter? And this was the foundation for this concept of immune contexture that we uh, uh, proposed. And for this assay that I'm going to describe in a minute, the immunoscore assay. So in that uh, uh, study, which was published back in 2006, uh, uh, we analyzed many, many cancer patients with colon cancers, quantifying with digital pathology, quantifying really precisely the density by uh, more than 6,000 immunostochemistry density measurements. Uh, um, quantifying different types of immune cells in the carcinoma, in the tumors. And we analyzed that in large cohorts of patients. So I will show a, a couple of survival curves. So for those of you who are not familiar with these type of curves, this is the percentage of survival, so either before tumor recurrence or before death, so before the death of the patient. So we start with 100% of with all the patients, and then as soon as patients are relapsing or dying, the curve is dropping, and this is the time. Uh, and here, as you can see, you have, we have a very long follow-up, more than 15 years of follow-up. So this is the standard way of classifying cancer patients with the international consensus, AGCC, UICC, TNM classification, stratifying basically the patients into early stage cancer, stage one, more advanced, so T3, T4 tumors, stage two, and even more advanced, stage three, now having lymph node metastasis. And this is basically only tumor parameters and the way currently patients are stratified. And based on that, the patients are receiving or not chemotherapy. So when we quantify the density of T cells and memory T cells with two specific stainings, taking into account the location where those cells were, so namely quantifying them in the center of the tumor, CT, or at the invasive margin of the tumor, so surrounding the tumors. What we found was that the patients with a high density of memory T cells in both tumor regions, in the, both in, in the center of the tumor and the surrounding, at the invasive margin of the tumor, those patients had an excellent outcome, as you can see, for more than 15 years, more than 80% of the patients had no tumor recurrence in that case. Whatever the stage of the disease, so even a patient at the later stage disease was protected and had no tumor recurrence later on. Vice versa, the patients with a low density of memory T cells in both tumor regions had a dramatic outcome, as you can see, in two years, 20, 20 months, many, many patients had a recurrence. Again, whatever the stage of the disease, or even a patient with a small disease, a stage two, stage one disease, those patients had a very rapid recurrence 
if these patients had low densities of memory T cells. So this coordinated adaptive immune reaction more than the classical tumor invasion parameter was really associated with the clinical outcome of the patient. And the novel paradigm came because when we did the statistical analysis, for the first time for any cancer, uh, putting into the statistical model to test the strength and the dependency of the parameters into a multivariate Cox multivariate model, so which tests the relationship between the parameters and which tests the strength of the parameters, putting into this model, the Cox model, the strongest parameters, so the T stage, the tumor progression, the end stage, the lymph node invasion, the grade of differentiation of the cancer, together with the immunoscore, not only the immunoscore, so by the way, this assay that I described, now we name it immunoscore, not only this immunoscore assay is highly significant on a multivariate analysis, putting these previous parameters into the model, but even more strikingly, and seen for the first time, these parameters now are no longer significant, which means that the, uh, they are dependent statistically on the pre-existing immunity of the patient measured by the immunoscore. So the tumor progression, the tumor invasion are dependent on the pre-existing immunity of the patients. And so we decided to put this into a term, so the immune microenvironment, these important immune parameters. So the immune contexture of a cancer consists in four parameters, the nature, the type of immune cells, in particular in that case the cytotoxic and memory T cells, the functional immune uh, orientation of the response, so in terms of the CD40 helper cells, the Th1 type of response, the density of these immune cells is very important and critical, and their location in different areas within the tumor and at the invasive margin border of the tumor. And so later on, we analyzed the reason why on a Cox multivariate analysis, putting all the key criteria that are usually significant in multivariate analysis together on the multivariate model, what remains significant is only immunoscore and the bowel perforation, which is quite bad, but the T stage and the N stage are no longer significant. And a direct comparison of this AGCC, UACC, TNM classification of patients in comparison to the immunoscore classification of the patients shows that the immunoscore classification is extremely powerful. So evaluating the pre-existing immunity of a patient is extremely powerful to predict the relapse of the patients, the survival of the patients, or the death specific of cancer of the patients, even more than the current way of classifying cancer patients, which led to this quite provocative editorial associated with our paper, TNMT is for T cell and M is for memory. And so back in 2009 and 2006, so way before immunotherapy was uh, uh, successful, we put the, the patients, the cancer patients, into main categories of patients based on their immune contexture. So we have a two category classification, so these absence, low immunoscore patients, no inflammation, no T cells, absence of immune response, these cold tumors, versus the high immunoscore, these hot tumors, inflamed tumors, subdivided in three categories with these intermediate uh, uh, immunoscore patients having an altered immune reaction, which we subdivided in this paper in two different mechanistic categories, either altered because of an exclusion phenotype, meaning that T cells were outside of the tumor, they were T cells but only at the invasive margin, not inside the tumor, versus those that were immunosuppressed, having different types of immunosuppression. So now we are refining this immune contexture, so the type of immune cells, so the cells are important, in particular cytotoxic memory, the density, so it's the quantification now that we are looking at. The spatial information is important within a tumor, the location, and the quality of the immune response by these immune uh, signatures is very uh, important. And this immunoscore assay basically takes into account these three parameters, the type of immune cells, their density, and their location with an immunostochemistry based uh, assay. We validated that in early stage cancer, um, and, and this is because patients with colon cancer having an early stage cancer, so stage one or two, they don't receive chemotherapy. They have the surgery, and there's no recommendation for chemotherapy because it's not been shown to be efficient, so basically, they, after the surgery, they are going home. 
But it's known that about 20, 25% of those patients will have a recurrence of their cancer. And this is what we see on those survival curves. So now this is a retrospective study with 18 years of follow-up. You can see that about 20% uh, of the patients with early stage colon cancer have a recurrence and will die from their recurrence. So we quantify the densities of the cytotoxic T cells and memory T cells in the center and invasive margin of the tumor, so the immunoscore assay, to look whether we could see those high-risk patients even though they had an early stage cancer. And indeed, it is the case. So patients with an immunoscore 4 here have high densities of cytotoxic and memory T cells in both tumor regions, high, 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 high. Then we have the 3 high, 2 high, 1 high, and 0 high, so low density of memory T cells in both tumor regions. So there are patients with a good adaptive memory cytotoxic response that are protected for 18 years. They will not develop any tumor recurrence. They had their surgery, they don't have any treatment, and they have a good immune system, and they are fine. But they are very high-risk patients. Those with immunoscore 1 and 2, and even worse, immunoscore 0, those are very high-risk, even though they have a small tumor, what is considered a, not benign, but a, a not very aggressive tumor. In fact, they have very high risk of relapse. And again, when doing a COX multivariate analysis, immune, this immune pattern, immunoscore, is highly significant. And the T stage, the progression of the cancer, is dependent on this immune pre-existing immunity. So is this quantification of the pre-existing immunity with immunoscore really clinically relevant, important? So we looked at different groups of patients by analyzing large cohorts of patients. Uh, patients with an immunoscore 4, so having high densities of cytotoxic T cells in the center and at the invasive margin of the patient, the median overall survival of these patients is 15 years, whatever other parameters. The median overall survival of patients with immunoscore 2, so an intermediate immunoscore, is 5 years. Patients with, who don't have cytotoxic T cells with an immunoscore 0, they will survive less than 2 years. So we are talking about major clinical significant differences here. But, and so we decided that this assay should be done because it's not done. And the reality of colon cancer classification, and it's the same for any, in fact, cancer type. It could be another cancer type or instead of colon. It could be lung cancer or gastric cancer. All the, way to cl all the, the, the ways to classify cancers are only based on tumor parameters, on tumor cell parameters, based on the tumor cell in extension and invasion, so the T and M staging system, tumor progression and invasion, or based on different ways to classify cancer that are all tumor cell centric. So pathology based, so based on the morphology of the tumor cells, is this a mucinous type cancer? Is this a serrated type cancer based on the tumor cell of origin? Uh, so is it a stem cell like cancer cell? based on molecular pathways, so chromosomal instable tumors seen, or microsatellite inst instability, MSI, or based on mutations of the tumors, or based on tumor gene expression consensus signature. That's the reality of uh, uh, current ways of classifying cancer patients. We, when a patient is coming at the hospital, we don't know anything about his immune system. We don't know anything about his pre-existing immunity. So the idea of immunoscore is really to put a first immune-based assay that would tell us something about the immune status of a cancer patient by quantifying cytotoxic T cells, measuring precisely their density, taking into account where those immune cells are with a standardized assay. So we regrouped uh, uh, many pathologists and, and, and clinicians and with the support uh, with the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer in the US, plus the uh, moral support of many cancer society and immunotherapy society, we decided to start a worldwide consortium. So we had very good feedback from many countries uh, to basically uh, uh, test a consensus assay that would uh, uh, define uh, the immunoscore of a given patient. So this uh, assay, basically, is an immunostochemistry-based assay. So this is a T cell staining, as you can see here. And every single of those brown T cells here 
at the margin or inside the tumor are counted. Precisely, so basically every single uh, uh, center from this consortium uh, tested their patients with the standardized immunoscore assay after a consensus discussions on ways to do it. All the raw data were QAQC'd and sent to an external statistician outside of the consortium at the Mayo Clinic who did all the statistical analysis. In parallel, all the clinical data were encrypted, sent to an external site uh, and sent to the external statistician. They made three uh, uh, independent cohorts with all those patients and tested uh, uh, in this training set and two validation sets the immunoscore of the patients. So it's basically done on routine all slide section. The full, so this is the full cancer. The full slide is quantified by digital pathology. So every single T cell on a given slide is counted. The mean number of T cells on a given slide is 88,000 T cells that are counted, and some patients have way more than that. Um, and it's two consecutive staining, so simple stain, very uh, a simple procedure with CD3 and CD8. There is a software basically defining the center of the tumor, defining automatically the invasive margin of the cancer, and this is the normal tissue. Uh, and that has to be validated by the pathologist, and there the software counts all the cells. So it's a very precise, standardized, and objective measurement, because it's not a subjective field of interest that is selected. It's the full slide that is fully quantified. Uh, and um, this led to a very recent approval of this publication into the Lancet for the internal validation of the consensus immunoscore for the classification of colon cancer. So these are the raw data. Uh, as you can see, this is the density of T cells in that case, so number of cells per square millimeter of tissue quantified. So there's about you know, 700 cells per square millimeter of tissue. The most striking finding is the huge difference from one, so each dot is one patient, one tumor from one patient. The huge difference is the log scale. So you can see that some patients have three times, three logs more densities of T cells than others. Uh, and the data uh, were validated basically in three categories. So immunoscore high in yellow, intermediate in blue, and, and, and low in, in white here shows that patients with a high immunoscore are, have a very good outcome. They have no tumor recurrence or very little tumor recurrence. And uh, this is validated in the two independent data sets with hazard ratio of 0 0.19, 0 0.27, and 0 0.33, all p-values below 0, 0, 0, 001. This was validated uh, for overall survival, for disease-free survival, for disease-specific survival. The multivariate analysis for immunoscore in two categories, high, low, or three categories, as I showed you earlier, or five categories, immunoscore 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 all being highly, highly significant in multivariate analysis, both for DFS and OS. And um, this is the detail of all the parameters uh, put into the multivariate Cox model in three categories. You can see that all categories of immunoscore are significant. And for the T stage, only the difference between T1 and T4, but not T1, T2, not T1, T3, only T1, T4 was barely significant. The others were not, no longer significant. And so uh, basically, these results validated the fact that the pre-existing immunity of the patient is important. Even more strikingly, so this is the current way with all the clinical parameters that are used today to classify patients. And this is a test to evaluate the relative contribution to the risk, the risk of relapse or the risk of death of the patient. So it shows what is important in terms of parameters. So the end stage, oops, the end stage is the uh, uh, invasion of the tumor. The T stage is the size, basically, of the tumor into the primary organ. The grade of differentiation, VLIPs, venous emboli, lymphatic invasion, so early metastatic invasion. This is without immunoscore, the current classification, all based on these tumor parameters. This is when we add immunoscore to the, uh, so this is the power of a single evaluation of the immune status of a cancer patient and its power. And this is the international classification in pink, and this is now by adding immunoscore to this international classification. So basically, 
Uh, we think that this international validation of the consensus immunoscore for the classification of colon cancer uh, uh, shows that it gives strong arguments, at least, for introducing an immune evaluation of cancer patients into the cancer classification. And we hope that at some point there will be a TNMI, TNM immune classification of cancer patients. This is validated also in, in randomized clinical trials in a given subtype of cancer, like stage 3 colon cancer, in this uh, randomized clinical trial with immunoscore 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 uh, uh, in a specific subtype of colon cancer. So basically, we have multiple evidence from animal studies to retrospective studies to prospective studies, even to meta-analysis, showing that the immune evaluation uh, of uh, 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 the cancer gives important information regarding the risk of relapse and the risk of death. So we wanted to study this evolution because we noticed that not all patients have the same type of immune response and that there is a relationship between the progression of a cancer and the progression of the immune response. So we wanted to understand the evolution of the immune response with tumor progression, taking advantage of large cohorts of patients at all stages, so from T4, T1, T1, in situ, T1, T2, T3, T4, knowing that there is a kinetics, a T1 tumor will become a T2 and then become a T3 and then become a T4, uh, not knowing the delta time it takes between those two, but having large course of patients at all those stages, we could evaluate the evolution of the immune microenvironment and basically look at the spatial temporal dynamics of the immune response, which led us to show this immune landscape in uh, the tumors by analyzing very large cohorts of patients with multiple assays, which we validated with quantification by immunostochemistry of the corresponding immune cell subpopulation. So each peak is a given subtype of immune cell. For example, here CD3 T cells, or here macrophages, or here B cells, or here granulocytes, etc. It is quantified in yellow at the invasive margin of the tumor and in blue in the center of the tumor. And the position of the peaks, the network here, represent the correlation and the relationship between those cells. So you can see that there is a network of immune cells with two subnetworks, the yellow subnetwork at the invasive margin and the blue subnetwork in the center of the tumor you can notice that some cells are present with very high density, for example, B cells, at the invasive margin, but are not present or at very, very low density inside the tumor, like here, see these B cells. You can see cells that are outside of the network, so behaving in very different ways, like the granulocyte, like the L17 producing cells. And now instead of plotting these cell densities, so the highest is the peak, the higher is the density of those cells in those patients, now we plotted the impact of each of those cells on the survival of the patients. So now we see this, the same forest of peak. The green peaks are the good cells. When they are high density, they are associated with better outcome and better survival. And the higher is the peak, the, the higher is the hazard ratio, so meaning the higher is the survival of the patients. So you can see that all these cells from this network, except the macrophages CD68, both in the invasive margin and in the center of the tumor, all those cells are good cells. The T follicular helper cells, the cytotoxic T cells, the activated T cells, the memory T cells, e the B cells are all good. Um, some cells are bad, like the L17 producing cells. And now we see, when we look at all the stages, that in fact this is not a static measurement, that the, the patients have different densities of immune cells at different stages. And what we showed was that in fact most of the adaptive immune cells, including the T cells, the cytotoxic T cells, the NK, the activated T cells, the memory T cells, cytotoxic markers, uh, even the regulatory T cells, they are decreasing with the progression of a cancer. Instead, there's an early increase of subtypes of innate cells, like macrophages, immature dendritic cells. There's a late increase of B cells, and we can follow basically each of those cells when they are appearing, when they are increasing, when they are decreasing. Those cells that are associated with the recurrence are most, the, the, the strongest associations are for the T cells, 
subtypes of T cells, in particular Th1 memory cytotoxic, T follicular helper cells, and B cells. And we had this uh, 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 evaluation of the tertiary lymphoid structures and showed that, in fact, there are two important cytokines and chemokines, CXL13, which is shaping the T follicular, by, through the T follicular helper cells, these tertiary lymphoid structures, helping for the generation with IL-21 that, that is produced by these T follicular helper cells to the generation of the good cytotoxic T cells and memory and Th1 cells inside the tumor. So we know that there are important immune parameters, important immune cells. Uh, but what's the relationship between the immune response and the genotype of the tumor? We were particularly interested in studying that in uh, colon cancer because a subgroups of patients with colon cancer have microsatellite instability. So what is microsatellite instability? It is a DNA mismatch repair deficiency. So those patients have a defect in a DNA polymerase which is not able to repair mutations and in particular mutations that are frame shift mutations. The particularity of those frame shift mutations is that they are passenger mutations but they are not random. Being not random makes them very interesting because we can predict where they will happen and they happen in regions of the genome where there is a repetitive sequence, like a consecutive suite of A. Very often, the, the, during replication, there is an additional A that is usually repaired by uh, the repair system, but which is defective in the MSI patient. So basically, it adds an additional A. And there's a frame shift mutation. For an immunologist, a frame shift mutation is very interesting because it totally changes the amino acid. So it basically gives a totally new protein, which can now be seen as a foreign protein, as a new protein that is detectable by the immune system. So we studied these patients with MSI versus those not having MSI, so the MSS patients. And what we showed that, in fact, there is a mechanistic relationship between the MSI status of a patient and the fact that those patients will generate a strong adaptive immunity by the uh, production of T cells that are specific against those frame shift mutations, against peptides that can be detected in those tumors uh, against the frame shift mutations. And we analyzed very large cohorts of patients with, I will have no time to enter into the detail of all that, but basically validated the type of frame shift mutations that we could predict showed that there were specific anti-tumor T cells against those frame shift mutations showed genetic evidence of immunoediting, so the uh, lack of those immunogenic mutations, but not of the non-immunogenic mutations, and showed that, uh, in fact, the outcome of the patients based on the MSI was almost enti entirely due to the adaptive immune response that was generated, which you can see on those survival curves. So overall survival here, or disease-specific survival here, there are four curves. The, the top ones are the high immunoscore, so immunoscore 3 and 4, high immunoscore, good adaptive immunity, cytotoxic T cells, both in MSS and MSI patients. They are good. Vice versa, the patients with a low immunoscore, so low adaptive immunity, those patients don't do well, whether they are MSS or MSI. And you can see that there's a, a, a statistical relationship in multivariate analysis between MSI, which is no longer significant, and immunoscore, which is significant. Uh, the only difference between those curves is that more frequently, patients with MSI can generate a strong adaptive immunity and more frequently have cytotoxic uh, uh, T cells. So, um, of course, now patients are treated with immunotherapy, so these Checkpoint targeting the T cells, so anti-CTLA4, P1, PDL1, so targeting those T cells. But there are tumors that are called tumors, immunoscore zero, like this, with no T cells inside, and there are some tumors full of T cells. And of course, uh, the predictions would be that uh, these patients are much more likely to respond to a therapy that is targeting the T cells, and those would first need a T cell priming. But the biology is not as simple as this is much more complex and not uh, uh, dichotomized into these good and bad types. There are multiple subtypes 
um, multiple subtypes. See if I can switch to the next slide. Yes. Uh, with intermediate immunoscore in between those extremes. And of course, depending on the type of immune defect, we believe that different types of immunotherapies should be given to the patients. So we, have, we were interested in trying to understand what is the mechanisms, what are the reasons why some patients have those very strong T-cell infiltration, adaptive immunity, and why some are weak and don't have T-cells inside their tumors. And we highlighted two uh, um, immune-based mechanisms, one of which is the attraction and the adhesion of those immune cells and subtypes of immune cells with the uh, uh, chemokines that are attracting those specific subtypes because they have the corresponding chemokine receptors and we could show the relationship between the density, the, the expression level of those chemokines and the density of the corresponding subtypes of T cells. And we could show another mechanism that is a local proliferation, so an expansion of these adaptive immune cells, in particular cytotoxic T cells, which is mediated not only through the recognition of the antigen, but also through the presence of a cytokine inside the tumor, IL-15, which expand the pool of T cells locally. I described this in colon cancer, but it is likely that this is valid for many, many cancers because this type of immune response exists in many cancers, and indeed in a meta-analysis of the literature looking at all the or these 20 different cancer subtypes, um, types, looking at different subsets of immune cells and their impact on the prognosis of the patient. So in blue, good cells, in red, bad cells, or in pink, violet, uh, no impact. These are more than 60 studies at the time. Uh, most of those studies, as you can see, showed the good prognostic value of cytotoxic and memory T cells for any cancers, uh, likewise for Th1, where it has other subsets of T cells like Th2, Th17, or Trx could be either good or bad depending on the cancer type. So, is there an immune escape at some point at the metastatic stage? Because, well, all immunotherapies are given mostly at the metastatic stage, but is at some point the immune system, uh, or the tumor is escaping the immune system? So to study that, we looked at very large cohorts of patients from colon cancer having either lung or liver metastasis. And we studied the liver and lung metastasis, so more than 400, actually now more than 600 metastasis. Uh, and some of these results are recently published, some are yet unpublished data. And so we quantified the immunoscore, so the same immunoscore standardized as we did in the primary tumors, we did it in the metastasis of the patients having stage four colon cancer. As you can see, the distribution of immunoscore between lung and liver is about the same, and the clinical impact for patients having a metastatic colon cancer, looking at the immunoscore inside the metastasis of those patients, oh shows that the patients with a high immunoscore on the metastasis have way prolonged overall survival. You can see here five years, so more than 70% of the patients are surviving five years when they have a high immunoscore in metastatic colon cancer, in contrast to the patients having a low immunoscore in colon cancer, where only 20% of those patients are surviving five years. An interesting finding for clinicians is that this, we studied also the impact of treatment on the immune response. And what we showed was that, in fact, so here are patients um, classified into two groups here with three criteria, the viability of the tumor cells, the fibrosis, and the TRG, which is a tumor regression grade. So how the tumors are responding to a treatment. And this is the patient, how the patient is responding to the treatment. So stable disease or partial response versus complete response or partial response. And this is the density, so the, the color means the density of immune cells in blue, high density, in pink, low density. As you can see, patients that are responding to the treatment have increased high densities of these adaptive immune cells, cytotoxic memory uh, 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 B cells in their tumors for the patients responding. 
But the most striking findings, I think, for a clinician is that, of course, a clinician is very uh, uh, pleased when he sees that the tumor is, tumor is uh, uh, responding to the treatment. Now we have uh, looked at the survival of those patients, classifying the patients into four categories, so immunoscore or TB score, high or low. So the top two curves are the high, high immuno, immuno score or TB score, high adaptive immune response. And then stratifying the patient into those that have a regression of their tumors, so those are classified TRG 1, 2, 3, pathology-based, or TRG 4 or 5 that shows no regression of their tumors. So of course, now we are looking at the disease free survival and overall survival. You can immediately see that there are two curves behaving the same. The yellow and blue, these are patients with high adaptive immunity, whether or not they had a regression of their tumors. Those patients have a prolonged survival. Vice versa, the patients that have a low adaptive immunity generated in their metastasis, whether or not they responded to the treatment in terms of regression of their tumors, they are doing badly. So it seems more important for a patient to generate a strong adaptive immunity rather than to have an immediate regression of the tumor in response to the treatment. The worst case scenario, we say, okay, is there a metastatic uh, uh, escape when patients have brain metastasis? So we pick in that case patients having any type of primary tumor. The only criteria for inclusion into the study was having brain metastasis. The brain mets were analyzed for their immune pattern, immune microenvironment, and um, we quantify with the standardized immunoscore quantifying the densities of CD3 and CD8 inside the brain mets and classify the patients in two categories, high immunoscore, low immunoscore. As you can see, patients with high immunoscore have prolonged survival. This is long-term survivors, five years for patients having brain mets. In contrast, the patients with low immunoscore are doing very, very badly. So huge difference in survival for patients having brain mets when they have a prolonged survival, when they have a high immunoscore. So there is no disconnection of the immune system. If there is an escape, it is a partial escape. The immune system is still present and is still connected and still has a very strong correlation with the survival of the patients and the relapse of the patients. So I'd like to finish up with uh, the current theories of cancer evolution. So there are mainly four. Uh, the theory on the, the, the model prediction uh, with the linear model, which means a consecutive accumulation of driver mutations. Uh, there is the neutral model, and these are different ca characteristics of those different models. Uh, the neutral model, the Big Bang model, says that, uh, in fact, there is a huge accumulation of multiple mutations before there is any uh, invasion of the tumors. And the branch uh, evolution, that is basically that uh, uh, different tumor clones at different time points could evolve in parallel. All those models who have different characteristics in terms of uh, 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 progression, seedings, etc. they have a common characteristics that they do not take into consideration a possible immune modulation, a possible immune pressure that would induce a Darwinian selection of specific tumor clones. And we propose another model that is basically a selection model, which is an immune selection model on which the, um, the main difference being that now we take into consideration the immune system and we're saying that a tumor and a cancer is not evolving and the tumor cells are not evolving only solely based on genomics or on the characteristic of the tumor cells, but based on the regulation and the dynamics and the interaction between the immune system and the immune cells. And we have data to support that and to analyze this, what we did was to take extreme patients, very rare patients, having very, very, very long survival, despite the fact that they have metastasis, and despite the fact that they have multiple recurrence of metastasis. So we could follow from primary tumors to, so this is in fact 11 years of follow-up 
of patients having at different time points. These are all metastases. So this is a primary tumor, all different metastases at this time point. And then all metastases were rejected. Uh, and then the patient was followed, got recurrence again, was followed, recurrence again, recurrence again, multiple metastases, which were all fully quantified and analyzed, both for genomics and immunomics parameters. So we followed the clones by doing exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, etc. So we could follow the evolution of the tumor clones. And we could follow the evolution of tumor clones within, from the primary tumor initial, to the different metastases. And this is the evolvogram of different uh, tumors. So basically, we can see from which metastasis, or from, is it from the primary or from a previous metastasis, that the next metastasis is generated by looking at the similarities, the identity between the mutations and the different mutations found in the different clones. What we found was that, in fact, there are different groups of patients with the different metastases, so those are all different metastases, based on the immunoediting of the mutation, so meaning the deletion of immunogenic mutations in contrast to non-immunogenic mutations that are not deleted, versus the immunoscore, so the quality and the quantity of the adaptive immune response. And you can see that there are different patterns of high, so low or high expression of uh, immunoscore. And we can trace back and follow the tumor clones, not the metastases, the tumor clones that are either eliminated, so that do not happen anymore, uh, even more than four years after, versus those that are persistent and found always in different tumor, um, different metastases. And basically looking at all different possibilities of chromosomal instability, transition, transversion, coding mutation, driver mutations, etc., what we could uh, see is that, in fact, the evolution of cancer and the evolution of the tumor clones are dependent on these parameters, are dependent on the adaptive immunity of the patient measured by immunoscore are dependent on the immunoediting, so the deletion of those tumor clones that have an immunogenic mutations, are dependent on the distance between proliferating tumor cells and T cells. So this is an important criteria where the expansion of a tumor measured by the proliferate, ongoing proliferating tumor cells and their distance to the next T cell uh, is associated with the recurrence of the metastasis. And finally, the size of the metastasis, which is a measurement of the proliferation of those tumor cells. And basically, we can predict with those uh, immunoediting the likelihood of having a recurrence. So, with that, if I can conclude. Yes. Um, so this is a summary of uh, what I told you. Uh, uh, basically, I believe it is important to uh, evaluate not only tumor parameters, not only the mutation of a cancer, uh, and in particular when we do clinical trials and we want to treat patients, and we think that we are making homogeneous groups of patients by making a clinical trial on a particular type of patient with a particular mutation pattern with a particular MSI, for example. The reality, in fact, is that based on immune parameters, based on the immune microenvironment, we are mixing apple and oranges. We are putting into the same clinical trials patients that are totally different in their immune composition. And by doing classification and immune classification of patients, I believe it would be uh, much easier, in particular in the era of immunotherapy, to have much more homogeneous groups of patients that are much more likely to respond to a particular type of immunotherapy treatment. And with that, I thank all the people uh, in the lab, all the clinicians who were involved into the studies and our sponsors, and particularly thank all the uh, consortium members who uh, uh, validated the worldwide uh, immunoscore study. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, so uh, we are open for questions. Yes. So, very nice talk. 
they are, I have a couple of questions. Some are very fast. So I'm not so sure if all the metastases of a given pacing at a given time, they will have the similar immune score. If this is a quality of the patients or the metastasis. Yeah. And then the next is that uh, uh, it's very, so this is a very powerful tool to predict the survival. But what will be more interesting is to predict which treatment is best. So could it be possible, maybe you're already doing, that you take maybe the intermediate uh, uh, patients, not the, the high and low, the, inter, the score two, and then to see how are they responding to the different therapies? Because obviously if they don't have T cells, uh, a checkpoint inhibitor will not do anything, but maybe there is a possibility to go now to the next step to say, this is maybe how can we change the, the, the response and the immune score maybe during the treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the answer to the first question is, is no. So the, the question was, is the immune score the same in different metastases? So the answer is no. In fact, each metastasis is like a new disease. So there, of course there are similarities in terms of the cancer cell. Some of the clones are coming from the primary tumors, but uh, each immune microenvironment within the metastasis is different. And in fact, when you deeply look at those metastases in terms of the genomics, in terms of the mutations, you also see that there are different entities, that they have different mutation patterns. Um, so, so each metastasis is evolving in its own way and, and, the, oh, and the immune response within that metastasis impacts on its likelihood of recurring. This is what we uh, uh, found out. Uh, the other point is that among all the metastases, they are not all equal in predicting the survival of the patients. So in fact, we had the luxury of being able to do that because we had a very large cohort of patients where all metastases were rejected. So we had full access to all resected metastases. So we analyzed the impact of the immune microenvironment on each of the metastases to see what was the most important metastasis in terms of immune impact on the survival of the patients. And clearly, there is a relationship between the strength of the immune response in the, in the metastasis and the survival of the patients, in other words, the metastasis that seems to matter the most for the survival of the patient is the one that is the weakest in terms of immune response. So if you have several metastases, the one that is the most associated with the survival of the patient is when you are measuring the least immune infiltrated metastasis. And that one is really predicting very strongly the outcome of the patient and, and is probably the one basically that is recurring and that is killing the patient. Um, yeah. Well, one brief question. Uh, in view of your interesting data which you presented here, particularly in colon cancer, how would you explain right now the frequently observed fact that in organ transplant patients and also in AIDS patients under severe and continuous immunosuppression there's at best a marginal, but usually not a real, increase of these cancers at all observed, which is also true for breast cancers and also true for prostate cancers. Yeah, so, so from the meta-analysis, it seems that there is a little impact on the incidence, but we are talking about two, two different things. One is the incidence, so the generation of a new cancer. When we don't have cancer, you have immunosuppression, is the immunosuppression uh, associated with the generation of a new cancer, which is a totally different question compared to what we have been doing, which is when you have a cancer, does it matter to have a good or a bad immune response within that tumor? So, so I think these are, are two uh, separate, temporally separate questions and really two uh, different outcomes. So we are currently studying very, very early polyps in order to see, in fact, what is, if there is any uh, importance of the immune response, and is it the same importance uh, of the immune response for the initiation of a cancer? But I believe that, that these are two uh, different questions. When you don't have a cancer, can you predict the fact that the adaptive immunity will uh, uh, prevent or not?
Well, it's really impressive, and see all these flames will be fantastic. The, my question is, okay, you, you use the, the immune score, which is a very convincing measure to show, to predict success of treatment. Now, the first question is, what's the percentage of among the whatever you were testing, the different type of cancer, between the, the patients that have low score and high score? That's the first question. The second question is more, I'm sure it's more difficult, is, you know, in, in cardiovascular, what the medicine succeeded to do is to take the low score people and make them very close to the high score people now with all the treatment, with the statins, with the different things. Now the, the gap in, in life expectancy is not as big as it used to be, it's actually. <coughs> My question is, is there any chance to achieve similar uh, success in the case of immunotherapy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the answer to the first question is, so the simple answer is for colon cancer patients, if we put immunoscore in three categories, because since it's, it, the density matters. So basically the higher is the density, the longer is the survival. If we don't dichotomize patients into groups, we keep the raw data, the real data of densities in linear, uh, it's very significant. So the higher is the density, the longer is the survival. If we dichotomize in three groups, in three categories, across all stages, uh, low immunoscore would be 25%, intermediate would be 50%, high immunoscore would be 25%. So the two extremes. Uh, but, Remember that I said that there is a dynamics and that in fact the immune response is changing. When the immune response is changing, the tumor is progressing. So what we see is that the immunoscore is maximal, let's say, in early stage, in T1, in, in this early stage. Then immunoscore is decreasing. When the immunoscore is decreasing, the tumor is progressing, is invading. So now if we are talking about a metastatic patient, which is the latest stage, now the distribution of immunoscore is there are much more low immunoscore patients uh, and much less high immunoscore patients. Uh, the answer to the second question, which is can we model it, can we put back a low immunoscore into high, the answer is yes. Uh, we have seen different types of treatment, even non-immunotherapy treatment, by looking at biopsies pre and post treatment, changing immunoscore and changing the immune microenvironment. We know that the the checkpoints themselves, when the patients are responding, what is happening is that they have an increase of cytotoxic T cells, an increase of granzyme molecule, cytotoxic molecule. So what is happening in the patients that are responding is in fact this good pre-existing adaptive immunity that we have seen to be important naturally is boosted when patients are receiving these types of immunotherapies. It's been also described for other types of immunotherapies like TVEC. So this is a, a, a viral a, a vector uh, vaccine type vaccines, which is in, inducing an adaptive immunity within the tumor. So we can change, depending on the type of immunotherapy we're doing, we can change the immune microenvironment and shift back a patients with a low type immunoscore to a higher, or in, let's say intermediate so far, I would say in, from intermediate to higher, probably not immunoscore zero to high because this is probably another mechanism that needs to be uh, induced, but. Um, okay, and what about combination? Today I can see, even in clinical trial, try to show combination of, for example, different chemo with, uh, yeah. with, with this kind of yeah. treatment. I, yeah, I, be, I believe the future of cancer treatment will be combination therapies, taking into account the pre the, not only the cancer cells, but also the immune, pre-existing yeah, immune response, and adapting the treatment to the immune defects that the patients have. Because not all patients have the same immune defects. Some have uh, loads of TGF-beta, for example. So maybe on those patients, the combination would need to inhibit TGF-beta. Some others have different types of immune defects. So I believe a more personalized type combination based on the immune parameters would be a good way to, to go. Thank you. One, one last question. 
Thank you very much. I wondered if this uh, immune score is a general tool for all types of immunotherapeutics or uh, for each specific type of immunotherapy, we have to develop a specific uh, sets of bi biomarkers because I can imagine for like, for, in for instance, for PD-1 uh, checkpoint blockade therapy, uh, PD-1, PD-L1 expression must be very important. And for CAR, CAR T therapy, probably is something else. So uh, would you comment on that? Thanks. Yeah, so there are two, two things. One is um, to evaluate, the, to classify patients into high risk, low risk, independently of their treatment. So uh, Immunoscore can do that. We've demonstrated it for colon cancer, and uh, we have data on other cancer types showing that it can be used and it's powerful in many different cancer types. So we can put the, diagnose, the prognosis of a cancer patients based on immunoscore. Now, there might be other immune-based parameters in other cancer types that may be more efficient, that may be more powerful. Uh, so we have to compare immunoscore to other signatures, immune signature for maybe different subtypes of cancer. For the prediction of response to immunotherapy, so we believe immunoscore can be used uh, even in the case of uh, 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 actually uh, CAR T cell therapy. Uh, we had a poster at ASCO showing that uh, uh, in fact patients that have been treated with CAR T cells, uh, so initially we thought that well, okay, CAR T cells, you inject this new generated uh, car, they will kill the tumor cells, and that's it. The reality is that it seems that the pre-existing immunity of the patient matters a lot on the likelihood of response to CAR T cell therapy as well. Um, so, it, so I'm not saying that immunoscore will be the, the, the whole thing for everything, but I believe that evaluation of the immune response of patients with standardized immune-based assay will be very uh, uh, important in the future to predict the patients that are responding to the treatment. Okay, one, one last one. <laughs> one last, time. last. The world has had this bad flu epidemics. The Spanish flu, for instance, 100 years ago. Would it make sense to study the prevalence of the cancer's death in the survivors of these epidemics? To study the cancer death, the, 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 the type of death, you mean? Or I'm not, I'm not sure I got the, the, the question. Yes. There are survivors to epidemics, the Spanish flu, for instance. One can assume that these survivors have better immune system than the others. If you study the prevalence of cancer death in those population, segments of the population, the survivors of the flu and the non-survivors of the flu, people that didn't add, could, 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 could we learn something about it? Um, Maybe what I can, I'm not sure it answers the question, but maybe what I can say is that we have studied uh, patients with cancer and looked at uh, the reason why they died. And also we, ex we did an analysis where we excluded all the cancer death related. So now we are studying patients that had cancer who died from something else than a cancer. So whatever. An infection, a cardiovascular. Looking at the survivors. Yeah, so we, do, so we did the opposite. We looked at the patients who died not from cancer, but who had cancer. And we looked at the immune microenvironment in the cancer that those patients had. And in fact, what we see is that the, the immune microenvironment within the cancer is also predicting the survival of a patient that is not dying from cancer. So there might be a general immune status that can be seen in a given disease like cancer that also may explain the likelihood of prolonged survival from another disease. I don't know if that, but that's this, this, the only study we did. Okay, I'd like to thank both speakers.